the world this is boxenberger the video game enthusiast from germany and i would like to welcome you to today's episode of the world of gaming and of course co-streaming again with wandering dutch so how are you doing my man oh so hey oh, now oh. everybody can hear me on nice my side happy days yes i'm doing well i'm doing well how about you thank you i'm doing good uh, I uh, I got a little pink eye. Yeah, uh, we were out of town for a week, and I, um, for some reason, got an eye infection. So I will be turning off my camera a lot today because I have to, like, use these eye drops uh, every ten to fifteen minutes, and nobody wants to see that. But <laughs> other than that, <laughs> I am doing great. <laughs> so we missed. Um, our regular show on Thursday because uh, we've been out of uh, out of town and um, uh, since there are so many news this week uh, and things we need to discuss Dutch we decided to do a rare Sunday podcast so Indeed. that's why you guys see us here today but first Dutch I want to wish our community happy a happy Easter weekend uh, for those who celebrate I uh, do hope you guys have a few days with the family and uh, in a lot of countries we have a longer weekend. Yeah, You have tomorrow off as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, Easter weekend, so yeah. we've got a nice four-day weekend, thank, thank God. Yeah, yeah, we have a four-day weekend too, uh, so that is fantastic. So I hope everyone gets some time with family, get some gaming time in and yeah. Just have an awesome Easter weekend, everyone. Um, so Dutch, let us let us start with the actual show. Um, of course, as always, you guys can vote in the chat what gameplay we're gonna watch here today. Um, so uh, the poll is still open. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 is leading. And that brings us to the question, what have you guys been playing? Let us know in the chat what you have been playing in Dutch, what kept you busy over the last week? Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't really been playing much, to be fair. I haven't had the, haven't had the time. Um, I've been uh, obviously playing and reviewing Bulwark. And obviously that review went up the other day. Mm. Um, very good game. Very interesting. Nice and chilled out um city builder slash sweet uh, resource management game and yeah that's that was very very interesting um if you haven't seen in fact people Senior haven't seen review yeah which is up on youtube uh, there are not that many reviews up so if you guys are interested um in in what what's that game uh like definitely check it out uh it's up on wondering Dutch's channel definitely definitely um and outside of that been playing a little bit more halo infinite um, jump back on that a little bit, um, and I need need to get back on to rebirth and get that finished, and uh, mm. probably be jumping back on that tomorrow on my last day off, um, nice. and do a nice, nice big long stretch on that tomorrow. 
Um, but other than that, that's that's pretty much all I've been playing. What about you? Oh, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> before I talk about what I've been playing, let us know in the chat what you guys have been playing. I'm also, well, we are always interested in in hearing what the community uh, is up to. So let us know. Um, so yeah, Dutch. Of course, I've been out of town for for a week. So I had my Ellie Rock Isis Rock Ellie with me, and um, yeah, I actually wanted to start Dragon Stockma so bad. I started that <clears throat> last Friday, played like the first two hours or so, and then on Saturday we uh, went off, and uh, it's the third party problem again. Yeah, so I bought Dragon Stockma on Xbox, and that does not allow me to play the game on the Asus Rock Ally. So I actually went back and played a lot of Starfield on the Ally. It Starfield runs so beautiful now on uh, on PC and especially the Asus Rock Ally because um it's got FSR3 now and you can play it at 60 fps with medium settings and um yeah so I played that all week and then we came back yesterday and I was like okay what do I play now do I continue with Dragon Stockma but I haven't finished Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth so I jumped on Dragon Stockma and that game is just so so good and I know that I will be spending 100 plus hours in that game so I decided okay let's finish Final Fantasy 7 first uh and I literally finished the game like 10 minutes before the show started. I beat the final boss, watched the outro, and uh, and uh, yeah, then uh, we went online, basically. Uh, so yeah, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was awesome. Um, I really did enjoy it. Um, for I, I don't know why, because the game improves basically upon everything that made the first remake so great. Um, the combat system is improved. You know, the side quests are more interesting. The uh, upgrading and, and party system has improved. So, but for some reason, it did not like grab me as much as the first one. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't really tell you why, um, because it is a fantastic game. I would probably give it a nine or something maybe a little higher 9.2 some somewhere in that ballpark um great story great pacing the the mini games were a little bit annoying they they have these weird quirky mini games that you have to play um they are not optional um the, like the main story forces you to play uh, those um from time to time um that was basically my biggest complaint because yeah. those were really annoying. Um, but other than that, uh, great combat, great story, beautiful visuals. Like that final boss fight is visually so impressive. The, the, the color choices and the way how they play with particle effects and, and volumetric fog uh, during that final boss are beautiful. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it is a, definitely a great game. Um, just maybe not as I don't know as addictive as the first one, um, but still definitely a recommendation um, and worth playing. Absolutely loved it. Um, great game. And then yeah, of course I've started with um, with Dragon Stockma. I'm still super early, like maybe three four hours into the game. Um, haven't even gotten to the main city yet uh it's but it is fantastic um so far it it hits all the notes for me you know i'm a sucker for these high fantasy rpgs like skyrim and witcher and whatnot and this is just you know it is not as it, it doesn't hold your hand as much as a skyrim or a witcher does but it is also not like Elden Ring, where you're just thrown in the, into the world and have no idea what to do. Um, that's definitely not it. But it's a great mixture in between, you know. It's not too much hand-holding. It gives you still a little bit direction where to go. But it's not like, oh, go to that marker on the map. Um, yeah. The combat system is very different for the different vocations. 
you can switch them out. Uh, and I've tried... Um, usually I play in these games like a sorcerer or mage or something, you know. Um, this time I went with fighter and it's uh, so melee combat and it's super fun. Um, it's not a hack and slash, but it's also not like heavily based on dodging and parrying. It's like a, a great mixture in between. Um, it's beautiful. Um, great story so far, um, but again, I'm I'm still super early. So yeah, but I'm I'm really enjoying Dragon's Dogma, like a lot of people do. And I know the the microtransactions have been like very controversial, honestly. So, but again, I'm still early, four hours or so into the game. Um, I didn't even notice that they are in there. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you've, I've heard you've got to go so out of your way to find them. To be fair. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, get the the the, the outcry um, the, so far, but maybe maybe they they will be a little bit more invasive later in the game. I I have no idea. We will see. I I will let you know next week when I have played a lot more. Mm. Um, so yeah, but that is basically what kept me busy. So let us see what the community has been playing. Um. So where do we start here? Luke is in the chat. Awesome, and he, I think he's back from his um, uh, trip to America. So nice. Uh, he has been playing Just Rebirth at the moment. Uh, what a gigantic game! It is gigantic. It is epic. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Um, then we have Ghost Fixture, who has been replaying Koto One and Two, and a little bit of Ghost of Tsushima. And he started up Witcher 3 again. Oh, you can never go wrong with the Witcher 3. Ah. I've been I've been tempted to install that on the alley again. Because that's basically the only device I have that I haven't done a full playthrough on. So, <laughs> um <laughs> uh Garim has been playing uh, some old games, World of Warcraft and some Valorant. Oh, very good, man. Very good. Good. Um, so, what else uh, do we have here? Uh, James has been playing uh, Rainbow Six uh, uh, Vegas and Vegas 2. He says it looks dated now, but it's still good for a blast through. And RSJ fan uh, 05 has been playing Final Fantasy 14. Oh, nice. I know it's out now, but I have not that many or i have not seen that many people play it um mm. have you uh, i tried it for about an hour when it was the trial period um like the, oh, yeah. the open beta type thing yeah, it's not my kind of final fantasy it's not <laughs> not in the slightest <laughs> um it's it's just it is a typical mmo where you've got like hundreds of fetch quests and things like that so unless you've got time for a massive mmo where you've got to spend hours upon hours before you even mm. start to scratch the surface of yeah. the story um then it's not going to be for you um I, I love final fantasies don't get us wrong i still own final fantasy 11 in its entirety on physical from when that first released sweet um but i, I don't think i'll dive into 14. Mm -hmm. good good sith lord has been staring at diablo 4. Yeah, staring at it, uh, and this still playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, yet Diablo Four is out in Game Pass now, um, and it is definitely a recommendation. It was my most played game last year. Yeah, I actually double dipped, bought it on Xbox and PC, um, and I loved Diablo Four. I know it's it got a lot of hate for some reason, which I really don't understand because the campaign was awesome really like the best Diablo campaign so far. Yeah. Um, the end game was, I think, good at the beginning. Yes, it's better now. It's like with every ongoing game, like, of course, the game, you can't compare Diablo 4 to Diablo 3. Diablo 3 has been improved over a decade. Yeah. Uh, but there was already at launch uh, lots of content in the end game. And um, so I definitely recommend it. And 
think next month they bring out season four um and they will do a lot of changes uh, to the loot system a lot of people are excited for that me included um so i definitely recommend uh giving giving um diablo 4 a, a chance it's it's great it's a great game um but yeah uh did we miss someone? Have you someone in the chat? Yes, Red Wolf is also, he says, Dragon Zogma 2 has taken over completely. Yeah. Yep. Yes, indeed. Which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll All get right, rid of it at some point um, when I get the chance. This month's going to be super busy with the indie it, showcase and things, so... Uh... Yeah, I know. Oh, by the way, let, let us promote that a little. Yeah. Um, we have we have a trailer now for the yes. community indie showcase. We do. And the date. So yes. let people know. Let people know. Yeah, so the trailer's up now on, on the channel, um, but the date is the 27th of April. Um, it's 7 p.m. UK, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, of course, when I did the trailer, it was still DST or Daylight Savings time. Um, now, the clocks have changed, so um, the the timing's a little bit different, but it's uh, 7 p.m. UK, 2 p.m. Eastern um, when it's airing. So, uh, and that's on a Saturday. Um, so, yeah, we've got, obviously, I've got a few surprises, announcements and things, uh, which I'll talk about on the week of. Um, but uh, we'll keep those we'll keep those surprises until closer to the time. But yes, it is soon. We're going to be having more than sixty games again this year. Developers involved. We're going to get developer interviews afterwards as well for you to watch. So post show content. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting. A few giveaways, some special guests. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You have to send me the trailer. Uh, yes. The next in the next show we can let the trailer roll here yes. uh, for everyone to enjoy because it is an awesome edited trailer so um yeah awesome looking forward to it man can't wait it's the 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 i've said it last year and the year before uh, what you do with the indie com community showcase is simply incredible it's the best Honestly, I'm not just saying that because we're friends. I truly mean it. It's the best indie showcase we have out there. No bullshit talk, just game after game, well edited together, always great looking games, giving smaller indies uh, the chance to, to shine. And I always come out of this in, uh, indie showcase with a list of at least 10, 15 games I need to check out. And... Uh, what what more can't can you expect from such a showcase? Um, Indeed. Indeed. So I I'm I'm excited for it, man. And there's going to uh, be a bunch more I, this time around. We've got um, had even more developers reaching out to us as well after seeing even just like the, the Bulwark review, and they're like, "Oh, can you check my game out?" And yeah, like that. so there's a lot of solo dev, dev projects on there this year as well as like studio projects and things like that. So there's a lot to look forward to and. Even teamed up with Sean Labrie this year to give it a nice graphics overhaul and oh, nice. fancy it up a bit more. It, uh, it had an overhaul the year before and it's getting an even fancier overhaul this year, so it's going to be good. That's awesome. Cannot wait. Look, really looking forward to it. So, yeah. Dutch, let us, let us get into some, um, some actual topics. Uh, before we get into the big one, uh, which is obviously Xbox and the big Phil Spencer interview and all his expectations for a handheld and um, PC stores on console and Gen C and the math of how, <laughs> how game development works and everything. There was so much, or is so much to discuss. Yeah. Um, we need to talk about The Witcher 4, man. Uh, because whenever there is Witcher news, I'm like, super excited and granted it's not probably not the biggest news of the week but definitely something i i briefly wanted to discuss with you guys um with you dutch and of course our awesome community uh so by the way uh if you enjoy the show don't forget to hit the like button i, I always get told uh, i don't say it enough on the show and people simply forget so um yeah if you do enjoy the show hit the like button and if you're new here consider subscribing um and if you're listening on spotify or apple podcast give us a rating 
there. We would definitely appreciate it. Um, but yeah, Dutch, The Witcher. Um, yes. CD Projekt Red had a, a little um, update, a business update. And um, they have reached their target staff size, about two um, for The Witcher 4, or the next mainline Witcher game. Um, the About two thirds of the uh, studio are working now on, on the next Witcher um, game, 403 people across multiple studios of them. And, um, the game is basically done with pre-production um, and they go into full production this summer. So yeah. just in a few months. And um, that obviously uh, led to the discussion. What do we expect from the game? It's like the biggest dev team they've ever had on a, on a, a single game. And it's um, leaving pre-production. So what do you expect when we uh, will see that game? Uh, it's now in go basically going into full development. So building out the world, creating all the assets, recording all the lines, uh, and so on. Um, what do you expect, man? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see them because obviously the, the major thing here for the next Witcher and going forward is that it's transitioned over from the Red Engine to Unreal Engine 5. Unreal Engine. Yeah. So that's that's going to be the biggest one. Um, I'm very intrigued to see how how that goes and how it translates all of the systems and things yeah. over to that engine. Um, and I hope, because obviously the beginning of this gen hasn't seen the greatest implementation of Unreal Engine 5. Um, there's mm. been a, more misses than there have been hits when it comes to performance um, oh. and visuals. We've seen kind of a lot of games in order to get performance modes have been sub 1080, which is ridiculous at, in this day and age. Um, so I hope, <laughs> I truly hope that they're able to really work with Epic in order to make sure that the game itself is both visually extremely pretty, but also performance-wise hits hits the performance metrics that we expect of a modern title as well. Um, obviously, no, we've had The Witcher three out for quite some time now. It's it's had its um, its updates and its upgrades. So we've got no. the the enhancements now to four K with and, and on PC, I think with ray tracing and things like that. So. Um, it's had its updates there. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I don't know what to expect from it yet because I don't know what route they're going to take and who they're going to have as lead character. Um, we can kind of semi-assume it might be Siri as lead character, but it could be also be another... It could mm. be a, another, a new male Witcher from a different angle. We don't know. See, I'm not sure if it's going to be Siri because the way they have been talking about the game is basically they're starting a new trilogy... And while I fully expect to have Siri and and Geralt to make a cameo uh, uh, in, in the game, I'm not sure if they will put one of the already known characters as one of the main characters. Um, I've always said what I would love them to do is to, you know, there are these different witcher schools um in the in the lore well the logo of this one and... is the cat isn't it so, sorry uh... isn't it the, the new logo for witcher for like the cat the last one was the wolf yeah, uh, it's not it, it, it's i don't think it's the wolf uh, uh, uh the cat um i think it's the wolf um but see these different schools would allow you to basically you know, make your own character in the game. Because that's something we haven't had in a Witcher game. We have always played as Geralt. We couldn't cast we, we could customize his looks a little. We give him a hairdresser or a, a new beard. But overall we couldn't customize our character. And I would love to see a Witcher game where we could do that. With the different schools in there, you could do it. Um yeah, uh, you could like even more focus on a melee uh, a fighter or witcher or a more like 
a Witcher that is specializing more in the science. I know you could do that with Geralt too, but you know, if you can create your own character, you can even more customize that. Um, and I would love to see that, honestly. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we, we shall see, we shall see. What do you think about the timeline? Um, I don't want them to rush it as much as we're, they, they've set their own timelines on when new yeah. witches will be out. I don't want them to rush it because the last thing we want is a game coming out and it's, it's got severe technical Absolutely. issues. And it's not so much the, it's not so much the content of the game because I fully believe they'll be able to yeah. easily get the content of the game down, no problem. Um, but it's more the technical side of things. I agree. Especially after Cyberpunk, yeah. you know, if they have like a buggy launch again, that would be, I don't think that they will do that again. Um, I think if if one studio learned the lesson, it's, yeah, it's, it, definitely it's them. CD Projekt Red. Right? Um, so yeah, I also think even though a lot of people speculate, usually, and, and they are right, uh, usually if a game goes into full production, it isn't like five years out. Um, full production, Todd Howard talked about this, like full production for one of their big um, uh, RPGs is a year, one and a half years. What it takes you after you have basically have prototyped everything, after you have finished off pre-production, simply building the game out. Um, it's a fairly quick process. Um, but then again, like you said, they are going for Unreal 5 this time. And while we still wait for like, you know, one super triple A major studio Unreal 5 title, the Unreal 5 games we've seen so far all suffered more or less from performance issues. I think the only one that ran well at launch was Robocop, it's at least the only one I can think of. If, if you have another example, drop it in, in the chat. But yeah, if you look at games like Immortals of Avium, which, yeah, was backed by EA, but still isn't like a, would you consider that a triple A game? Probably not. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what, what triple A game did we, get from, from a well-established studio uh, that uses Unreal 5, did we get? So, and Unreal 5 also makes a lot of progress. Yeah, we talked about it last week. Um uh, with the uh, with the state of Unreal uh, from GDC, a uh, lot of improvements there. Um, so yeah, uh, and I bet that Unreal, uh, pardon me, Epic is working with CD Projekt Red together on this because it's also for Epic a showcase title. Yeah. Because usually we don't get that many open world action RPGs running in Unreal. Yeah. You know. Um, there's like I can only think of one true open world game, and that is Days Gone. That was still on Unreal Four. Maybe I'm missing one, but you know, Unreal is not really known for big open world. massive open world yeah. uh, RPGs. And having a Witcher as as one of a showcase tiles for your engine definitely is something. So I. I would assume that Epic takes care of CD Projekt Red. And, I think the closest um, they've got to a semi-open world was Gears 5. Yeah. Mass Effect, maybe. Mm. That was Unreal. At least uh, the, the first trilogy, but granted that's old, very old games now. Yeah. Um, On Unreal 4, I think that was probably the, the largest semi-open world they've done. That was Unreal 3, bro. No, um, Gears 5, uh, Gears 5. Yeah, Gears 5, semi-open world, Days Gone, the only one true open world. So, yeah, um, we shall see, man, where, where The Witcher goes from here. Um, shout out to Sith Lord, who sends in a channel member for chat for being a channel member for 20 months now. Thank nice. you so much for the continued support. He says... You can rely on death te death taxes and boxy say Witcher or Diablo Four. Yep. Ha! Huh. I di I don't get the thing with the death taxes. Uh, but if you had made me choose it between Witcher and Diablo Four, obviously the Witcher. Yeah, yeah. The Witcher is one of the best games ever made. Uh, so. Yeah. 
Boxy's Boxy's played um, The Witcher more than he's had hot meals. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> like I've done five and a half complete th- playthroughs, including all DLC, doing all the quests and everything. So that's a lot of time. I love The Witcher Three. That's a lot of time. Probably five hundred hours plus. Oh, and and the rest, and the rest. But the point yeah. at that point though, you know where all the quests are. You know where all the things are. You know where to search. You know where to get there. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> and you skip in, and you skip after the th- third playthrough. You skip a lot faster through the conversations. Yeah. You know, like yeah. So. Yeah, but again, I'm a sucker for those kind of games. Uh, I probably have a similar playtime in in Skyrim. I love these high fantasy RPGs. Uh, that's why I'm so so excited about Dragon's Dogma right now. It just hits all the hit all uh, hits all the notes for me. It's, um, yeah. Um, all right. The Witcher uh, Four. By the way, since we are on the subject, um, the Elder Scrolls uh, of of high fantasy RPGs. The Elder Scrolls had uh, celebrated its thirtieth um, anniversary this week. It did. Uh, it absolutely did, and we got a little tease uh, from uh, Bethesda regarding Elder Scrolls Six. Um, they said, uh, we are playing early builds and it has us filled with the same joy, excitement and promise of adventure. And people were, I've seen a lot of people already, oh, it's already playable. And um, yeah, of course, when you're prototyping the game, you have playable builds. Uh, you have small segments that you can play to see what kind of mechanics work, what doesn't work, and so on. It really doesn't mean that the game is already in a playable state in the nope. way we think about a playable state. Uh, I I wouldn't keep my hopes up that we see this game anytime soon. I mean, just last year, Phil Spencer uh, said during the FTC trial um, that this is a... F- when he was asked whether it's going to be exclusive, that he... And he said, like, yeah, a game that is five plus years out, um, we we don't have or did not have made any decisions yet. So um, this is probably not going to be a this gen game. It's going to be a next gen game. Yeah. Even if next gen starts in 28 and not like the rumors say in 26, even then, uh, I don't think that it's it's going to be a this gen game. Maybe cross gen, but not not coming out during this this gen um but anyway uh, 30 years of elder scrolls um make me think i started with daggerfall i never played the first elder scrolls i started with elder scrolls 2 daggerfall and ever since i've been a huge fan or what about you man um i think see i'm nowhere near as far back as you i think the first elder scrolls i played was oblivion um and at that point i didn't really like oblivion because of the weapon degradation and then they ditched the weapon degradation on Skyrim, and that's when I really got into it. So Skyrim was my first mm. love of Elder Scrolls, and I'm glad they ditched okay. the weapon degradation. <laughs> okay. As much as Oblivion might have been great, I did not like that. And I, we've spoke about this with Zeldas. It, 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 yeah. Weapon degradation has no place in it. If, you, if people want it, you should have a toggle in the menu, weapon degradation on or off. Off. Yeah, I... It's one of one of those gameplay mechanics where to this day I don't know why any developer thinks this is fun in a game. Yeah. It, I, they, there's no example I can of, understand of why they would want way. to do it for like realism. But outside yeah. of that, in terms of raw playability and fun in a game, weapon yeah. degradation is not fun. I can understand if someone yeah. wants a realistic kind of game. In which case, maybe he's put that option to have weapon degradation in, but don't force it. Have the default as weapon degradation yeah. off. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. If someone in the chat can think of a game where weapon degradation was actually fun, let us know. Maybe we are missing one. Um, but I can't think of a single game where I thought, like, oh, that's cool. That's a good mechanic, you know? Yeah. Um, so... 
Yeah. My love, by the way, for Elder Scrolls began with, um, well, I played Daggerfall. I, but the, the game or that made me really, really fell in love with, with the Elder Scrolls was Morrowind. That was just mind blowing. And um, it is actually the game that made me like an Xbox game of first. Yeah. Um, because at the time I was playing, a, I had the consoles, yes, but I was playing a lot on PC. But I still went to university, I didn't have much money, you know, and wasn't able to upgrade all the time and do the PC stuff, you know. Um, and I lived in a shared apartment at the time and uh, my roommate, he he actually got the, the first, the OG Xbox and... Of course, we played a lot of Halo on that. And then when Morrowind came out, I was like, awesome. My PC is not able to run it anymore. I don't have money to upgrade it. And now I can play a game that is like, was actually built for PC on a console and yeah. get like the same great experience. And that's really what made me an Xbox first gamer. Um, so, okay, but... Uh, Morrowind and Elder Scrolls, not the biggest topic of the week. We, 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 I could fill up entire podcasts, though, about that. Maybe yeah. we should do that at some time. Dedicate, you know, dedicated podcasts to a to certain game franchises. Like Fantasy RPGs. About, like, entire podcasts about the Elder Scrolls series or entire podcasts about Mass Effect or, you know what I mean. Yeah. Could think about that. We could, we could do one offs that. where we get people involved and we'll have big discussions on franchises. Oh yeah. Like a big big discussion on Elder Scrolls, big discussion on the Witcher series, big discussion on Yes. Fallout and you know Not, and Halo and, and yep. Gears. Gears uh, and you yeah. name it. Yeah. We should we should do that, maybe. Yeah, let, let us talk offline about this idea. Yeah. Um let us get to the big topic. Uh, Xbox. Um, they've been making moves lately. Um, obviously, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we learned about <clears throat> them bringing a couple of first party games or exclusive games to PlayStation. The community didn't take it too well. Um, let me put it this way. And ever since Xbox, I don't I don't know what it is, but I mean, if we look at this year, yeah, we in two months or one and a half months, we will get a Hellblade 2. We will play Avout this year and Indiana Jones and Stalker. And it's actually exciting to be an Xbox gamer right now. But for some reason, there is this negativity surrounding the brand um and to some degree i actually understand it uh but yeah they're making weird moves yeah even though some moves sound exciting like the handheld um or maybe steam or or epic or whatnot on, on consoles still there's there's some negativity around xbox at the moment and um we will talk about all those things. So we will talk about now, of course, about the big Phil Spencer interview and a couple of things he said, because there were a lot of different things and Polygon actually broke it down into multiple articles uh, dedicated to certain topics, handheld, um, third party or PC stores on console about Gen Z and uh, growth of the industry and how much game development costs right now. And there's a lot in there. Um, and we will, of course, uh, get to the leaked all digital Xbox and um, <clears throat> about a report from GameIndustry.biz uh, where some, the, w they, they put the rumor out there, you know, that some bigger third party publishers might skip the platform and and all that stuff we will get to that um and i want to dedicate a segment here today also about what's happening in the xbox community because it, it is is sometimes weird these days uh, out there so dutch with what do you want to start like, like 
and let's talk about the handheld. Yes, let's 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 talk about the handheld because me and you have been speaking about the handheld since last year. But all of a sudden, <laughs> Boxy, yes, we have. all of a sudden, Boxy, it's big news, and every it's person's an insider. But we've been speaking it's about it since last Twitter, year, man. since Gamescom yeah, last year. Yeah, let people know why that is, man. Yeah, so we had a we had a one on one conversation with the Xbox hardware team at the time. It wasn't just about. Um, handheld that was actually later on in the conversation which we spoke about what was wrong with the hardware currently what needed improvements in terms of both the controllers yeah. as well as what the the physical hardware we have so the series x and s um so we went through all of that and later on they were talking about improvements to the consoles going forwards as well as other things so then they started quizzing us about handhelds what do we like about the handheld options that are available now? What don't we like about the handheld options available now? What would we like to see in a handheld? What things are important in a handheld? What pricing range do we think is suitable for a handheld? What features do we want to see or are most important to have in a handheld? Um, so we went into fine detail what with the hardware system. team. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of system, operating system? Um, everything you can imagine we went into fine detail with the hardware team at gamescom about what we want to see in a handheld um so we spoke about that in detail we spoke about how we thought it was important that the handheld was native for a start um one of the the options that we we wanted was of course being native being able to play your games no matter where you you had them um so of course as we do now when you've got play anywhere you need that when it's on the move so you'll be able to install your games and play them on the move on a handheld system yeah. um, we spoke about the screen types we spoke about the price points and what what they considered high or low in comparison to the options available out there at the moment such as the steam deck or the rog ally etc um so we touched on those it wasn't much that we didn't touch on when it came to the handheld in terms of audio quality as well you i think you mentioned was that the the rog ally and you said the audio quality of the rog ally was like superior to all the other models and um and you thought that it was it was truly a really good experience there um then we spoke yeah. about the screen types personally for me i think the an oled panel would be great although expensive um and opposed to just your um your lcd screens that you tend to find in the basic switches which are okay, but it doesn't really truly represent the colours very well. Um, so there was a lot of things we spoke about and that they took away. And price point wise, we we mentioned us. I, I said somewhere in the region of five, five hundred, um, six hundred maybe. And um, they were saying, okay, well yeah. we've done research to say it's it higher. It's difficult. Yeah. yeah. Pricing is, is difficult with such a handheld because you don't want it too cheap because you want quality hardware. Yeah. And we spoke um, mainly as well about the battery po the battery issue with handhelds. And when you the start to put yes, higher quality exactly. hardware in there and make it more powerful, then you've got a really big battery issue, um, which we've seen in the likes of Steam yeah. Deck and you've seen in Rug Ally. Like the battery's okay, yeah. but you could never do long stint gaming on, on one of those. You couldn't do four or five hours in not a row. With, not without a power bank. Yeah. But if you've got a good power bank accompanying you it it it's actually fine yeah um yeah it is it is interesting because the demand for handhelds is obviously out there the steam deck has been massively successful there are lots of windows uh based handhelds out there now the rock ally the lenovo and so on um and so far they have been also fairly successful um but yeah we spoke about the third party problem a lot, especially I did uh, as yeah. an owner of um, of the Rock Ally. The third party problem is what I like to call the problem of where do you buy your third party games? Because obviously, with the games in Game Pass, basically the first party, you can boot, it, boot up Starfield on the console and pick up your save file on PC. Yeah, and those uh, Lenovo's and Rock Allies are Windows-based devices, so you just pick it up and continue. Just like it's it's a seamless experience as you wanted it to be. But as soon as we talk about third-party games, 
And let's be frank here, most games we play on the uh, uh, console are third-party games. At least for, for me, that's the case. Yeah. Um, so uh, you you end up having the problem where to buy them. Yeah. Do you buy them on Steam so you can play it on the on your handheld, or do you buy it on uh, on on Xbox console uh, so you can play it on console? Of course, the PC gamers don't have that issue. Um, yeah. They just play on PC anyway. But there are lots of people that don't do not want to be PC gamers for mainly um, me included. I but it's that that's a me thing, you know. It's like I sit in front of the PC all day at work. When I come home and want to play games, I want to just relax. On the couch, and that's why I prefer console gaming. And I all handheld. I love the Rec Rock Ally. I love to play games in bed and when I'm traveling. Uh, and unfortunately, I travel fairly a lot for work reasons. And so I want, I want, I, I like, I, I like the handheld experience. But where do I buy my third-party games? And so for Xbox. And Phil uh, Spencer specifically mentioned that also in the interview. Um, he said he has this list um, of things they should do, uh, and he talked about this the, this problem um, specifically. We've been talking about this on the on this podcast for for months, um, but uh, it it so sounded to me like he knows about it. And would it be? Assuming that the that they will make a handheld, and we will get to that in a second, uh, but um, would it be a good idea to to release another Windows based handheld? Yeah, since there are already uh, already so many options out there, the most successful obviously being the Steam Deck, uh, which isn't Windows based. Um, yeah, but since PC gaming basically is Steam, yeah, let's be real, nobody plays on Epic. Uh, let alone the Windows Store. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and and the Ally and Lenovo, they actually run Windows. They are basically a laptop in a different form factor. They're, it's literally Windows when you boot it up. So, um, would you do like another competitor to those? Um, especially thinking about it, uh, that they that Microsoft already has a lot of partnerships going on with Lenovo and with Asus and so on. Um, do you want to scare that off? Or do you want to make something unique on the market? Because no other uh, PlayStation doesn't have that. Uh, they don't have a native handheld that runs their, their console OS. They have the PS Portable, uh, which is a streaming device. Yeah, but that's not what, what people want. Do you want. You want a native handheld that runs the Xbox OS. So all your games... Also, the third-party games that you buy carry over to that device. And one thing I would like would to say as well is that the difference between what would be a PlayStation, PlayStation's last attempt, where they created a whole new media type for their games on PSP and built a yeah. whole a whole different types of games and specifically built for the PSP, this would be the opposite. It would be a digital-only platform, so you download your games onto it, you don't have to worry about media, as it were, physical media, etc. As long as you're able to download those yeah. games and install those games, that's essentially all they need to do is worry about the, the space on there. Yeah. So make sure that you get a 512 or a, or a 1 terabit version of it um, and just make sure that, of course, it's able to run the games natively. Um doesn't need to be the biggest options, yeah. essentially, as long as it's Series S quality games on there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so yeah, um, in the interview, Phil definitely sounded like they are working on one. And like you said, after our talk with the Xbox hardware team at Gamescom last year, we were like going out of this interview because they invited us to this meeting for 30 minutes because they wanted to talk to us about what do we like about the Series X and Series S and the controllers that we currently have. Um, and I actually don't remember how we came to the point. I think I casually mentioned that I just got the Asus Rock Ally and then they were like, um, and that, that, that I played a lot on the Steam Deck. 
like as well and and um and then they cancelled their adjacent meeting <laughs> talked to us uh, for another 30 minutes just about handhelds and we were pretty sure that they are working on one because the way how they asked us these questions um and the, the way how they responded to certain things um we don't want to get them into too much trouble so we leave a couple of details maybe out of this conversation because I think yeah. they told us a couple of things they probably shouldn't have. Um, but they clearly done their research before they'd started speaking to us and asking us these questions. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, but at the end of the day, um, we were pretty sure, okay, they are working on one. We yeah. had no idea, obviously, on what timeline that is, and still we don't. Um, we have no idea, uh, but we were pretty sure that they that they are working on one, and that was in August last year. Yeah. So, which isn't too surprising. Um, uh, I mean, Jess Corden from Windows Central, shout out to him. He also mentioned, yeah, they, they have prototypes out there all the time. Um, they are prototyping all the time different things, and obviously that's what a hardware team does. Um, but yeah... Now, especially after this week's interview, I think everyone knows um, that they are really looking into that. So that um, Phil also mentioned about, uh, talked a lot about this third party problem and how to get access to actually all of your games. Um, uh, and to me, obviously that sounded like they are really considering making it with the Xbox OS. And again, I think it would be the only wise thing we, they would put out like the quadrillionth Windows-based handheld. Um, why, why would you invest in that if you could also get like a good Lenovo or an Asus or, or even the Steam Deck? So yeah, with with it running the Xbox OS, they would have a differentiation on the market. So, but Phil also talked about this in a way where it's obvious that this is something they they want to do um, yeah. for multiple reasons. And one is, of course, extending extending their customer base. Um, do you think a handheld would be something to lure people in, uh, new gamers in that are currently not Xbox customers? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You've got that huge switch market there. Um, and they they play their games yeah. native. They don't play their... Obviously, there's a few big games that are cloud only on Switch, but ultimately they play their games native. Yeah, and, well, but it's... Yeah, um, yeah, but that's just because they're, yeah. they're down to the power of the hardware. Um, but ultimately, there's a massive market there. There's a massive... It's, you've got to think, and again, he, he touched on it, yeah. and people got really nervy about it, the whole, the, the whole Gen Z thing. But ultimately, when you look at the market... That's playing a lot of these games now. It's the younger generation. You're talking about kids that play on tablets and phones and switches and the ROG Ally or the yeah. Steam Deck and things like that. They're becoming more and more prevalent because kids can just sit there instead of doing like going to a PC or they don't take up the TV. So they sit there and game on the tablet all day. Ultimately, those are the, the target audiences they want to try and hit as well. And when they see these out in the wild yeah. and they tell the parents, oh, I want one of these Xbox handheld things then that's ultimately the demographic they're going to go for, as well as us geeks who just want to have one yeah. to go and lie in bed and, and use one. <laughs> Absolutely. I would, I would, like, this would be for, for me, but I'm already very invested in the Xbox ecosystem. Um, yeah. And, and, and the other console ecosystems anyway. So they wouldn't gain a new customer with me. For me, it would be like a fan service, yeah? Yeah. And uh, the question really is, uh, would you... Because that, and we will get to to growth in the console space uh, in, in a second. But um, to me, I I feel like when you look at all the the most successful consoles ever, and PlayStation just made sure that everyone knows that the PS2 is like the most successful console ever. But a lot of people bought the the PS2 back in the days, and people forget that not just for gaming because it was the cheapest DVD player on the market. Yeah, when it came out, yeah, um, and 
obviously it was a great console and a great system, no, no doubt. But this was something, yeah. The Switch did something new and is on track to becoming the most successful console ever. The Wii did something new, something different, yeah. So if you think about these super successful consoles, it's always about doing something different, giving you something unique. And outside of the Switch, we don't have that. And yeah. the Switch really is basically a Nintendo machine, meaning most third-party games skip the platform. You know, um, you will not be able to play a Diablo and and a Dragon's Dogma and a, I don't know, there's only a handful, like, uh, it's unfair, there are a few of, obviously, yeah, there's The Witcher on there and Skyrim, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's the the switch is really not a a, a system for third parties. Uh, third, the the main third party publishers bring their games to Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. Yeah, and in that space, you don't have that that handheld. Um, Steam has been very successful with it. Now, basically, they created. A, a, a console-like experience, and I know you can boot up Windows and 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 hack uh, and and play Game Pass games, but it's basically nobody does that. You know, it's like less than one percent of Steam Deck users actually crack the 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 system, boot up in Linux, and 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 crack the system to to boot up Game Pass. Nobody does that. It's it's a Steam console. It's a Steam console. That's what the the, the Steam Deck is. And yeah. they have been successful with that. There is obviously a demand for for that portable gaming. Now, if you can mix that with the regular console experience, I think this is could actually be even more successful than uh, the Series S has been because. Because it offers you something that you do not get at, at your at the at the competitor thing, uh, yeah. Uh, and yes, you can argue you get it on PC with with the Steam Deck, but console and PC have been both growing for decades now in parallel. Because some people are PC gamers, some people are console gamers. There's a market for both, and in the console space, we don't have the handheld. There's no handheld again i'm leaving out the switch uh but if you want to play the next assassin's creed game you, you can't do that on on the switch yeah that's why i'm leaving that out again so the the console space for for third party games is playstation and xbox and you don't have a, a handheld option and so yeah it is something that i see as a potential Success. Um, out there. I know I would get one, obviously, but um, yeah. So the big question now is that sh probably a lot of people don't ask themselves now if they make one. The question is more when do they make one? Yeah. There are two theories out there. Um, mostly two theories. There's a lot of other bullshit out there as well, but you know what I mean. Yeah. The one is they launch it with the next gen. So basically, the Series S is the Xbox handheld, and there will be a standard main console, the successor to the Series X. Um, that's that's the one option. And the other say, okay, this is actually the mid-gen refresh now that we are getting. You know, uh, either this or next year, uh, we will see see that handheld being the mid-gen uh, upgrade or refresh thing. So what do you think? What is the timeline on this? I think it it uh, I think it would be more likely um I think it'd be more likely being a, more of a next gen thing as much as we'd love to see a handheld more recently I think it'd be more likely the handheld replace the S and become this dockable Series S essentially that is also a handheld um whereas then you've got the physical stay at home Series X that's what I think is going to be the, the timeline. So I think the next gen will launch with it. And But seeing that, we've also kind of seen for a while now that Xbox are potentially planning to launch the next generation earlier than anticipated. So um, I could see an announcement about it soon, um, talking about it. But uh, yeah, I think it's more likely to be the second. I think it's more likely to be 
Mm. Series S is replaced by the handheld dockable Series S. Yeah, I think so. I think that this is the more likely scenario for multiple reasons. Yeah. Um, there's this practical thing that um, you... Xbox already has two SKUs out there. Bringing the handheld would be the third SKU that developers have to optimize for. And then how do you get developers to do that and support that properly? Um, we know for a fact that, um, and I'm not sh shitting on the on the Series S. I still think it's probably it, it was probably a good idea for them to do it. it do it. It is definitely a good idea for customers to have an entry point and a cheaper, uh, cheap entry point. However, um, there's also no denying that Xbox already has a relatively low install base uh, in terms of consoles, and then you have two SKUs, and especially less powerful takes up a lot of time to optimize. We've seen that with Baldur's Gate last year, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but the game, because of that, came like half a year later um, or five months later um, to, to Xbox. Um, and it, if you add the handheld now, you would may have a third SKU. Um, so I think that alone is probably a reason why you would launch it with the next gen. Now, um, and again, it would make like a great differentiation for next gen um, yeah. because a lot of APUs are now developed for particularly those kind of devices, those handheld devices. AMD has the Z1 Extreme out there, which is in the Lenovo and the Asus ROG Ally and so on. And they run on a different architecture. They are already on in A3 chips. They are Zen 4 chips, uh, CPUs, you know. Um, it's it's a different architecture. And so, yeah, bringing that now midterm, I don't think that's likely. Yeah. But then on the other hand, then on the other hand, the demand for handhelds is high right now. Um, Steam Deck is massively successful. Um, the others, also, um, not to the same degree as the Steam Deck, but the Lenovo's are successful, the Ally is successful. If you wait another three years or so to bring those kind of devices, um, maybe the market is already saturated, people have moved on um, on PC uh, to those kind of devices. It's, it's hard to tell when is the right point. Uh, if you would have won this holiday, which is I think highly unlikely, but just for the sake of argument, this would be a, ma a a perfect time. You know, it would be disruptive in the console space. It would be the demand right now is high for those devices, and you would not give your competitor the heads up to react to that. And it's also something you have to consider when running a business. Yeah, if they, like you said. They have more or less announced it with these interviews. Yeah, we like the idea and we wanted to do this and that. Now, PlayStation is also listening to those kind of things. And if you wait another three years, you give you give your competitor time to react. So there, there's an argument to be made for both scenarios, starting with next gen or bringing it, it for this gen. Um, I really don't know what, what they will do. Um, it's... Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, Anything yeah. It's I understand. It's it, it will be. It obviously would be disruptive. I think uh, the thing with handhelds though is they've always been highly popular. Um, Nintendo really started the the proper trend off with the original Game Boy, yeah. then the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advanced, and each one of those has sold hundreds of millions of units each time. Yeah, that's the market that you're trying to crack into. Um, ultimately, and that's the one. That remains popular. The on the go, the on the go crowd, the kids. Um, so I think although the high scale handhelds is very much popular right now, such as 
the Steam Deck and the Ally, etc. I think that's yeah. also not specifically the market they're targeting. They're not targeting the PC market. They're targeting the console market. Yeah. The 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 yeah. younger generation gamer. So I think it is in one way. Yes, it would it it would be great for them to release it sooner rather than later to try and take advantage of the ROG Ally and the Steam Deck crowd. But I think also, on the flip side, it, it's also kind of irrelevant because the Switch is ultimately very popular still. It's one of the most popular and yeah. highest selling consoles ever. Absolutely. And, and then you've got the launch of the Switch 2 in the coming years, which will yeah. reignite the handheld thing again. Um, so... That's the kind of the, the the ones you'll be cracking up against because when people will be weighing up the Switch 2 versus an Xbox handheld and the quality of games that you're going to get both graphically and performance-wise on the Xbox handheld versus what Nintendo put out, depending on how high-quality system they present, is ultimately going to be the way-up choice for those kids. Do I get the Nintendo, which can play Mario and things like that, or do I get the Xbox and now I can play Halo on the go and Gears on the go and mm. Call of Duty on the go? And those ultimately are going to be the kids that you're trying to win over. That's the that's the demographic. We're going to be buying technology regardless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we well, but we are the really the hardcore gaming yeah. uh, base, and I think again, this is the question. Um, um really is how can you lure in new customers yeah. yes the younger generation is definitely one thing to look at um and we'll talk about chen z and and phil's statement on that in a second uh but i also think like our demographic um has a lot of potential for growth um and having this hybrid console that you can plug in in the tv and take with you on the go it it also has a lot of potential for for those and it has a lot of potential to actually bring over the playstation customers because as much as phil talks about the industry as a whole not growing there's still plenty of room for xbox to grow in the console space that exists now um, and yes, you have to throw away these, this kumbaya mentality that they have been uh, or ha have had for, for a while. But there, there is growth in bringing customers over from PlayStation. And it is getting more challenging by the day because, and Phil also talked about that in, in other interviews uh, last year, like when he talked about the worst generation to lose was the PS4 generation because that was the generation where everyone started to build up their digital libraries. But so so if you want to bring customers over, you have to offer something <clears throat> unique, something you cannot experience over there. And I could see a world where a lot of people say, hey, I can still have my PlayStation, but I have this hybrid console that I can plug into my TV and I can take on the go and I can play the games then. And it is like, it is a unique offering. And there is a demand for handhelds, obviously. And it's also a demand in the PlayStation community, the PS Portal. There are people that have it actually enjoy it. It has its limitations because it only streams in your local network. But again, there's a demand for that. And if this offers native gaming, no internet connection required all the time. You can take it on the go. You can play it at home. You can bring customers over. So there is growth in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we shall see. Um, I'm really not sure. Actually, I, of course, being a selfish gamer, I would have. I would love to have that device this holiday. Um, absolutely. And uh would buy it in a heartbeat and sell my alley probably for it because it would solve my third party problem that i have with the windows based handhelds um but yeah i don't think that this is the case i think we will get something different this holiday season um and maybe let's use that as a segue because a couple of um images have leaked 
from uh, a white Xbox console. Yeah. And we know we know that there's hardware coming this holiday season. In the business update uh, that we got in February from Xbox, Sarah uh, mentioned that, yes, um, we are uh, getting new hardware this, this holiday. Everyone already kind of knew about it because last year they basically leaked their entire roadmap um, and we had this cylindrical Alexa-shaped um, um, Xbox Series X that basically is a slim, a little bit better Wi-Fi, a little bit better Bluetooth, new controller, which was exciting. And of course, um, and of course, uh, a, bi uh, a bigger hard drive, but it's not a, a mid-gen refresh. It's basically a slim. And we all assume that this is going to happen. Now, these images of the white Xbox leaked, that is also all digital, looks like a Series X, just without a disk drive uh, and in white. Um, what do you think we will actually get? Because I have, I have my thoughts on this. Um, yeah, it won't be that leaked first. image. I think that leak, that actual leaked image is, is outdated. I don't think that's the yeah. actual image of it. I think that's just something that's been dug up from a long time ago. Because even Phil Spencer said, listen, the plans that we had then have changed. These are old plans and they've changed and things have evolved and we've we've changed what well, well, avenue we're going down and things like that. So we will get a refresh. I don't think it'll be a white discless Series X. I think it will probably get an old digital, but I don't think it'll look like that. Um, every time we see a leaked one, it's always the white. I'm sure it's pretty much similar to the previous leaked images we had of it as well. Um, so no, I don't. I don't. I, I, I assume this year we'll probably just get a revision, like a mid-gen refresh, and um, with some minor upgrades. Um, I don't even think. I'm not even sure if they'll do a pro model series console this time around um no, still, i think they still pretty much up. already said that is that this is not going to happen yeah but spencer mentioned that last year during gamescom what's the point in doing one this gen um there's there's really no point in that and let's be real uh we would have learned of that uh, in this massive ftc league if they had one in in the plans and yes plans change all the time that's the case but they do not suddenly dig up a pro or enhanced model of a uh, of, uh, proper mission refresh out of the blue and release it the year after that's simply not going to happen yeah so i don't think we will get an, a, a mission refresh from xbox this, this time yeah yeah same i agree but yeah um the about the leaked white images, I have two two issues with the, that. Um, I don't think it's going to happen, the, this white all digital console, because first, the, the leaks about the actual Series X Slim, you know, the cylindrical one, whether it will look like that or not, yeah, uh, that, that might change, um, especially after the adorably... Uh, looking <laughs> comments and everything. Um, th this is what what you do uh, halfway through. You release a slim, and you don't release like a couple of months before that another version of your console, the all digital. There's really no point in doing an all digital white Series X in the same form factor than the Series X in summer, and then this holiday season release a, a a slim model it's yeah. not gonna happen and second of all this was obviously printed by a 3d printer and it is probably just a you know a mock -up. some images from from mock-ups and 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 stuff people read too much into those those kind of um leaks um so yeah i think that it would make sense for them to release at least a slim this holiday season, price it accordingly, um, because they are going up against the PS5 Pro, which is probably coming this holiday season. Yeah, um, it's all but confirmed. Um, 
and and have an exciting new controller along with it. Um, th that plan would make sense to me. A white Series X all digital console in summer just doesn't make sense to me. So yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe they even maybe they even ditched that uh, that slim. Uh, just bring out the new controller and then actually go for the plan to focus properly on, on a next-gen console in 26. Um, but I would also assume, because a lot, I see a lot, I've seen a lot of people say, ah, yeah, well, in the June showcase, we will get the reveal of the next-gen. You're not going to announce a next-gen two years in advance. And I know that they basically announced the Series X a year in advance um, at the Game Awards. Uh, 2019 in uh, in December and then they released it uh, the Series X in November 2020 you know 11 months in advance um that would still mean that we would not see it like December 25 yeah you know what i mean um it's not going to happen um so Whatever hardware they're going to announce this June in the showcase is the hardware that will come out this holiday season. And maybe they surprise us completely with that handheld. Yeah. Um, and I could also see if the handheld isn't a holiday release this year, but somewhere next year that they announce it because it would already hype up your your platform it would give people a reason to invest already into into the xbox ecosystem you know um knowing that they will get a handheld next year where they can play and get uh, all their games that they buy now um that would make sense but um yeah we're not gonna get an announcement of next gen this year it's not gonna happen yeah um but yeah uh Dutch, a lot of other things have been said by um, Phil Spencer in this in this interview. Yeah, and one of the big things is, of course, uh, and I've seen a lot of people talk about that, and uh, it is a, a super interesting topic that Phil Spencer kind of wants other digital storefronts, and he specifically mentioned Epic uh, and itch.io on yep. Xbox. A lot of people, and I did it also in the thumbnail of this podcast, yeah, I put in the Steam logo because nobody uses, nobody uses Epic or itch.io. Uh, PC gaming is basically Steam. Um, but Phil Spencer didn't mention Steam. He mentioned specifically Epic and uh, itch.io to bring those PC storefronts to console. Um, he said... Uh, nobody would blink twice about windows having multiple storefronts uh yeah basically saying hey we're a windows company it's nothing new for us to do something like that um why wouldn't you do that on a on a console and basically solve the third party problem that way yeah that's of course also something um what do you think about this um is this going to happen i mean if Phil talks about it in an interview with Polygon like that. He doesn't say that willy-nilly, you know, because Microsoft and Phil know whatever he says uh, will make headlines the next day. So yeah. um, what do you think about this? Is this a good idea? Is this something we will see rather soon? What do, we, what do you make of this, man? I mean, it's a great idea. We'd all love to have our our PC storefronts on our console, but I think the implementation of it is easier said than done. Um, if you go for a native handheld console, for instance, then that means that the PC storefronts would have to be available on not only the handheld, but on this the physical um, physical version as well, the, the full-on console. Um, they're mentioning just um, allowing now you've got keyboard and mouse support for cloud games um yeah. so i think they've got a full tilt into keyboard and mouse support for xbox in general as opposed to just the odd title um and that would solve part of the pc gaming issue but 
on the other side, then the mark replaces that vast on PC um, with Epic and Steam and H.io, etc. Um, there will be quite a few hurdles to, to get around. Um, now, for indie developers, it would be a fantastic thing because that means that they would only have to port the game for Steam or Epic, wherever they port that game for. And if that game is automatically available on Xbox consoles because of that, um, then they wouldn't have to worry about it. But then that would mean that the Xbox user would have to have multiple logins. You would have to have a Steam ID or an Epic ID or an Itch ID, whatever you call that. Um, she'd have to have multiple logins for these things. They'd have completely different and overlapping like achievement systems that they have and storefronts. Um, and then, of course, the compatibility thing is there's no guarantees all of these games would work. Of course, with Steam Deck, they have to have um, Steam approved or Steam verified, it is, I think it's called, mm -hmm. in order to go on Steam, Steam Deck. Um, not all of them, they work, but some of them don't work well unless they're verified, in which case they've been kind of optimised for Steam Deck. Um, and that list does grow, but that that's another issue. Like the store, It's not that easy to get that store, storefront verified. And because Microsoft also would have no control over what's on Steam or Epic, etc., in terms of content then content moderation would have to be downplayed by Xbox. Because if you have a look at half the stuff that's on Steam, most of it wouldn't get onto Xbox in its in its yep. format. So there's a lot of hurdles. There's a lot of, it's, it's, it's great in practice, it's great in thought, but there's a lot of hurdles to overcome to make that a reality. Yeah, I do agree. Um, I mean, in general, the idea is great. Yeah for for consumers um at least for the most part there's one thing i will get to that in a second um that i thought of but um for the most part it's 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 a great thing yeah um have access on your console especially in combination of course with a native handheld um uh, to all your libraries yeah and let's be real People, a lot of a lot of people have multiple libraries uh, now. Yeah, I have my library on Xbox. I have the library on PlayStation, on Nintendo, on Steam. Hell, I even have a couple of games on Epic, um, although I never use it. <laughs> but um, and Amazon Marketplace, they do games every now and again. Yeah. So yeah, you you have multiple libraries and. Um, unifying that on one device uh, would absolutely be cool um no doubt but there's of course like you said multiple la layers to this that wh where i lack right now a little bit of fantasy but hey uh if phil talks about this in in such an interview i think they are actively working on this um to make this a reality now whether that's actually going to be steam or whether it's really just like stores like epic and itch.io is is another question but let, let's break it down there's the technical level first and foremost you have to make the games run on the console um and the steam games or epic games are really not optimized for console so how would you make them run there yeah uh do, do, will you leave like all the settings and people have to uh, try to figure out okay what's the best setting uh to to make that run on a console or not how would it actually work because they are all windows based and not xbox os based uh, games so how would that work on a technical level yeah. and there's of course the business side of things um these games that are released in steam or in epic or on itch.io <coughs> they have licenses for windows and if, if a, a publisher releases their game on on xbox os they have the license for that um and i think it it's fair to say 
it, it is a big question which games would actually be be allowed to be on xbox after being published on steam or epic you know um because publishers want to double want us to double them um they yeah it is it is it, it is a legal thing so with the licenses and everything you have to sort that stuff out and then of course the question is what would be your business model on console let's be real here if you could play all your steam games on xbox why would you buy the next assassin's creed on on xbox and not on steam it usually is 10 bucks cheaper on steam yeah it would automatically mean you can play your games on pc on the steam deck and on on xbox console but where would microsoft or xbox make their money from yeah and of course that means would they be able to subsidize the hardware in the same way that they do right now and this is the the, the one thing where i say okay is this it could be a that could be a, apparently it's a potential downside of this because what would be the business model for xbox how would they make more money off of this by offering the games from steam on on xbox um this is these are all questions um that you have to figure out uh now that's why i said maybe that's something that they wouldn't do with steam but with epic because epic is also super struggling with the epic game store they haven't made any money off of this it's it's it, to me actually it is surprising that they are still existing um because they have been losing money with the the epic game store ever since it's uh, it's release you know um now bringing such store over to console would obviously mean hey <clears throat> um epic could get a big boost out of this and therefore maybe that's a business model for them um you would still have to figure out the license thing and you would still have to figure out the technical thing but epic would actually have an incentive to do that what would be what would be the incentive for steam steam it's it's different because like you said there's tons of shit on on there um and that's another thing you have to figure out consoles are as convenient as they are because they are controlled systems everything yeah. that is released on xbox on playstation has to go through certification yeah it has to fulfill certain minimum standards hmm. you don't have that stuff on steam yeah so yeah you would deal with all the things not just bad running games but also with cheating with um hacking and everything and hacks and everything that you simply have on the pc platform that you don't have to the same degree on on the console so how would that work um as much as i, I like the idea i'm i'm not sure how this would work in in total but then why would phil mention it in in such a way if this isn't a real possibility so yeah do you think it's, it's gonna happen or what is to this no it's it's wishful thinking i think it's more something that phil would love to happen like all of us we would love to have a singular portable system where you can yeah. access everything and retain all of your games so we'd love to have the native experience where you can play your xbox games on a handheld that you have purchased on a console and have access to all your steam games and have access to all like it's the ideal situation to access everything in one place for a yeah. normal person but when it realistically it's not it's just not straight it's not simple there's so many red lines that they have to get through and so many kind of issues that they have to go through in order to make it happen it's it's not really a realistic dream to have um far too much red tape yeah yeah so i, I agree um it's 
I, I, I'm sure, otherwise Phil wouldn't have mentioned it, that they are in talks with Epic and Itch and obviously Steam. Um, if it will happen anytime soon, I would also say I'm not sure. I don't think so, because there are so many hurdles you have to take from legal licenses to technical things to opening up your console ecosystem to things you don't want to have on a console to what figuring out what would be the business model on xbox on on the console um there's there's a lot of things they, they would have to figure out um and i'm i'm not sure um but maybe maybe someone in the future man maybe yep. someone in the future um Phil Spencer also talked a lot about in his interview, um, changing the subject by the way, because I don't have a good segue into the next <laughs> topic. <laughs> um, Phil also talked about um, the general growth of the industry and that the um, mass layoffs that we have seen the Xbox division um, <clears throat> was also mainly due to that reason. Um, they, you remember, they recently laid off 8% of the employees, mainly the ABK um, staff um, was affected. And yeah, he says also that the, the growth limitations of the industry is basically uh, pivoted towards the Gen Z habits with younger players mainly playing on tablets and such things and uh, basically them wanting to play their content, their games, wherever they want and whatever device they want. And that there is just in general no real growth uh, in, the, in the industry and he thinks about how can we start to grow the entire industry again. What do you think of this man? I mean, there is, there is, there is a case for it because, of course, we we like to remember the world on what we've grown up with and how everything's evolved with us. But if you go back to if if our parents, for instance, were coming yeah. in at, at where they started gaming compared to where it is now, and they've moved on and they've done what they need to do and a lot of them still game but ultimately things are a, a significant difference compared to playing on essentially a, a gaming console that was a cassette player where you had to rewind the cassette in order to play the game um to to now where it's all digital storefronts and install things on machines and things it's a vastly different thing and the habits of gamers have changed significantly since then um now, like you say, you, you never used to have mobile gaming then. If you did have some form of mobile gaming, it was um, on an actual pocket device. Um, and even then, it was maybe limited to the likes of Tetris or Pong or Space Invaders or something in your pocket. And it was just a singular game. And you used to buy these little games. Um, and that was it. And then they changed to the Game Boy, and then the younger generation got Game Boys, whilst the older generation was still either maybe on console or on PC. And that's just how things are. So as much as we don't want to hear it, we are the older generation when it comes to gaming now. So technology advances and they try to meet match the demand of the generation that's ultimately going to make the money again um, going forward. And they're the ones that they're kind of aiming for. And the habits of those are significantly different to the habits of us. So whilst we might not have... Again, you have to look at it from an older perspective, but... Our habits are different because we've got responsibilities, significantly more responsibilities than those of younger generations. Yeah, We've got families and kids and and jobs to contend with on top of all those three things, as, as well as potentially trying to balance your, your normal life in there. Um, younger generations, a lot of the younger generations don't have families, they don't have kids, they're just by themselves, or maybe he's got a partner or something like that, that's a bit different. And then the younger generation again, They've got different habits all over again. They're all mobile, playing on tablets or phones and things that are, things that didn't exist when we were younger um, and, and is now very prevalent. Um, so, yeah, things do move. And, and naturally, as a technology company, they have to stay 
they have to say relevant to all generations. So while we will get things that are aimed at us, like high spec, high and expensive consoles, or things on gaming PCs, or talking about technological advances like ray tracing and things like that, that's what matters to geeks like the old timer geeks like us who like to see these technological advances. The younger generation don't care. They just want to play wherever they want to play on a tablet or a phone or a console. Ultimately, where is the most popular to play it and what is the most popular thing to play it on? Uh, that's what the younger generation wants. So it is it is true in essence. We we have to move with it, move with the times as much as we don't want to. Uh, but the companies do as well because ultimately that's a, that's a fresh batch of people that are getting consoles for the first time or coming into gaming for the first time or or trying to target those that might be kind of part-time gamers and get them to game a little bit more. But even when you're talking about the handheld systems and things like that, those also positively affect people like us with families and, and little time to, to game because... You don't have the, all the time in the world to sit in front of a TV and play games all the time and things like that. And you, you might get the occasional hour or so. And it's going to be a lot easier to just pick up a handheld and play on that for a couple of hours than it is to go and sit down and turn on the TV and then look through your library for ages and decide on what you want to play. And then, then maybe you get an hour and by that point you've got to put the kids to bed, you've got to make the food, you've got to do so on and so forth. So... Yeah, the, the habits, the gaming habits of, of the, the general demographic have changed over the years and it will continue to change and of course they've just got to stay relevant within that. Um, at the moment the demographic though is pointing and I think that's where they're looking at it as well. The demographic of those who play the games currently is actually significantly older than what it was in historically. So the demographic for gamers is actually on average higher on an age bracket than it was before so they're actually losing out on that lower end bracket than they did in previous yep. generations previous generations it was the lowest gen the lowest end of the scale that was playing the games they're the ones that were significantly picking up consoles all the time or getting them for the birthdays and they were the ones gaming um a lot but now it's more the older generation that are doing it because it's it's a vice it's something to get away from daily habits and work and the, the grind as it is, it's an escape as opposed to just a, a, a hobby that used to be for, for the younger generations. Now it's f firmly, on average, played by the elder generation. So where console manufacturers are losing out on their money would be more yeah. the kids now because the kids are gaming more on mobile and tablets than they ever have. Yeah, while that is true, while that is true, I still don't think that the the growth of the industry is is or, or the lack of growth of of the industry is to blame on the gaming habits of of Gen Z because no no I think the lack of growth in the industry is um, the, is the is the habits of while mobile gaming tablet gaming you know. I think it's a lack of growth, specifically when it comes to yeah it, the, so our our generation. Up. It's what I think <laughs> it must be a, a marginal delay here, um, like a, <laughs> a, the the habits of what we do these days compared to the yeah, habits of the the Gen Z, like, and that's the issue. I think it's the the issue is is our gaming habits now, and the growth that we represent now isn't as substantial as it once was. They've essentially we. And what we do and how we play games and the way we purchase games is significantly different than what we have before. And I think the way people buy games these days is also part of that issue because we, we'll we either wait for a sale or we'll wait for it second hand or we'll, we'll buy it on something if it's cheaper or we'll wait until somebody else has told us multiple reviews until... Whereas the way it was before wasn't like that it was arched differently we'd go the most we'd say a review was in a magazine you'd see a few screenshots and you'd go that's the one i want to get and you'd buy the game or your friends would all be playing it and you'd yeah, buy the, the game the gaming market yeah but the gaming market overall was significantly smaller at that time i the, the way i look at this is the the industry or the 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 game 
aiming um the the, the people's uh, the, the the gaming demographics has gotten older uh, like we are still gamers like 30 years ago there were probably barely any gamers that were 40 plus years old you know and that definitely has changed and of course you have to ask the question what's the new generation doing and how are they playing and and yes uh, tablets and and phones and so on definitely one way to to where they play games now um but then i look at my kids and even uh one of my sons is in in second class right now in second grade right now and he's um even those those kids are still playing on console granted that's uh, uh mostly nintendo um at, at the moment but there's demand for console gaming there too and uh, my kids prefer to play on a console rather than on, on on a tablet and also granted our household is probably not representative of the standard household these days because their daddy has everything they can play on xbox they can play in playstation they have access to a nintendo and uh, on uh, to a pc if they want to it's definitely not uh the, the standard but also, all all the, the kids at school, they love to play on consoles. So I don't think that this is the way how it, it, what really limits the, the growth right now. I think that what limits the growth of the industry is probably more the way we play games because... I was going to yeah, say... Whenever, whenever you've seen like... a. a a disruptive moment in the gaming space like the Wii take the Wii as an example suddenly the elderly have started to play games because they love to play the those there was something new about it you know and we haven't seen that we haven't seen these kind of innovations in, in recent years then also what we have to consider and I know that this is how business work you, you usually look at the last year and the year before that and the year before that how do we doing in terms of growth. We come off of the pandemic that started four years ago, where you have suddenly seen a significant growth. And now, of course, the growth starts to slow down again, because it's now in back to normal way how the industry grows. And guess what? The 20-year-old gamer of uh, from today will be will be having a lot of more disposable <laughs> money um, in 10 years. And there is growth to be made with the, this kind of generation. Um, and <clears throat> the question obviously is simply, how do you do that? And I think one thing where I do agree with Phil is having access across multiple devices, because I think gaming is still the only form of entertainment that is limited to certain devices if you think about movies if you think about music if you think about books if you everything else is um device agnostic yeah uh, it's exactly yeah and and gaming isn't uh, that um but then of course gaming is also a, simply a different thing because you don't have to optimize movies. music yeah <laughs> or movies, you know, to, uh, uh, to be able to be watched on a phone and a big TV and the and the cinema, you know, you don't have to do that. Yeah. But you kind of have to do that with with games. You have to optimize them for certain hardware. So we've yeah, also it's, seen it's it change different. though with with the types of games the demographics are playing now. And you have to have a look at the yeah. most popular and most successful games on the market. And we've already seen this shift because a lot of them have tried to get into it. The shift to the the Fortnite and the Robloxes and all of that thing is yeah. That's the most popular. That's especially for that demographic, and that's where we've seen a shift from a lot of these manufacturers on how do we do a popular games as a service game in order to appeal to that demographic. And that's yep. the shift we've already seen and we continue to see. And then the issue is, is then they're looking at technologically going forwards, how do we appeal to the demographic that does the Fortnites and the Robloxes and what are their gaming habits? Yeah, of course. Um, they, but then 
again, it all comes down to disposable income. Yeah. If I think back at my time when I was at school, and those were the days of the Super Nintendo, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and the uh, Mega Drive. And the Mega Drive. And like I hadn't didn't have any money to buy a game. No. Nope. So what did what was the case? You got like one or two games for your birthday and one or two games for Christmas, and that's about it. And then you started trading those on the on the schoolyard, you know. Um and uh, today with games like Fortnite or Roblox. The, the thing is, they are free. You know, you can actually play them. Um, yep. Yeah, and my kids are super into Minecraft these days, of course. Yeah, and um, they are. Uh, it's it's a super cheap game. You buy that once, and they, you can play that for for years. And um, and but those demographics, they will earn a lot more money in a couple of years and um, have have that disposable income. And then you can grow them into becoming PC gamers or into becoming uh, console gamers. So I think what we see right now is just uh, is, is like a little bit an over shoot of an effect that happened with COVID, where you had two years where gaming was like growing in a way it hasn't grown in a long time. And now we are simply back to standard growth. But now you look at, at the likes of Microsoft and other publishers uh, that talked about this as well. Yeah, uh, they look at the sales lab from last year and two years ago, and then it, you suddenly realize, oh, we are not growing as fast anymore. And and that that's the thing. And it's, that leans into the next topic that Phil Spencer discussed about the the... The development costs um, of games that have gone up and that it, the math is simply different now and we've heard like spider-man costs 200 million dollars to make a games and so you really want to be able to scale across multiple devices because that is the nice thing about software it can scale you have to build it once you don't have production costs afterwards basically like you do with hardware that you sell yeah you simply scale, and the more devices that have potentially access to it, it's it's beneficial. And with these high development costs, um, the math has changed. So, um, yeah, I do understand that Xbox has this issue about not seeing growth anymore, uh, or, or not or not to the degree that they probably want to. But then. And I don't want to be too negative, overly negative on this, but then I think about, okay, what makes you grow your, your ecosystem? And at the very end of the day, it's the games. And as exciting as the future roadmap for Microsoft looks, and I said it earlier, I mean, in six weeks we get Hellblade 2, and then we play Avowed, and then we play... Uh, um, uh, Indiana Jones and all these other great games, Towerborn and Stalker this year. So far into this generation, Xbox hasn't released that much. You know, it was like the, the first year of the console, they didn't have any games. Then they released uh, Forza Horizon and, and Halo in, in terms of bigger releases, yeah, that might actually shift consoles, yeah. Um, then they had, again, one and a half years of nothing. Um, and last year, they release Starfield and then another Forza, you know? And is this really what, what is this enough to, to like grow your ecosystem? If you have consistent games and we know that we are now at the, at the start of this phase where Xbox actually has continued, uh, a, a continued cadence and regular cadence of, of quality games coming. That's, that's the baseline for growing your ecosystem. And to blame it basically on the on the Gen Z habits, um, I don't I don't know if this is this is the right thing. And it actually stuck with me a little bit because I've had a couple of discussions um, in the DMs with different people. I don't know how you see this, but so far Xbox has not delivered the the things that you need to actually grow in a meaningful way let alone the marketing issue, which we've talked about 
multiple <laughs> times, like every other week, we say, okay, if you don't market your stuff, um, you can have the best product in the world. If nobody knows that it exists, um, it's not gonna sell well. And and if I look at that, that is the, the way more obvious thing why Xbox hasn't been growing in the way that they wanted to grow or need to grow. Um, than the Gen Z habits or an overall like in the industry, because again, yes, I know development costs are, are up, but if you release quality products, they still sell like crazy. If you look at, look at the Harry Potter, not Harry Potter, um, Hogwarts legacy and, and all those games or Baldur's Gate and so on sold. Yeah, there is. There, there is a, a huge market for quality games. Um, and yeah, uh, the reason why you wouldn't grow. Yeah, and if you think about the handheld thing, it offers something unique that your competitor doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, have, you know, offer something to, to differentiate yourself, then why wouldn't you grow? Um, especially since you have a great product. Yeah, they have the best service out there with Game Pass and the unified ecosystem across PC and console, um, at least to a certain degree, taking third-party games out of it. Um, but yeah, they already have that, all those things, great backwards compatibility, a great hardware. But yeah, at the end of the day, you can have all those things if the content isn't there and if marketing isn't there. Why would you grow? It's it's the way, way more obvious um, thing than blaming it on Gen Z habits or, or general industry problem. You know, I don't know. Uh, I think it's I think it's part of the issue. Yeah, I think it's part part Gen Z is part of the issue because obviously we're all getting There's older. They're getting something older. Something wrong on your end? I don't know. It seems. It's just a little bit of a delay every time. Um, you're budding hard, bro. Weird. I've got no idea. There's nothing, literally nothing Sorry, running you apart from... you have to repeat from... that. You are... Yeah, nothing running apart from OBS and this, so no idea. You are budding up. Okay. I'm just going to transfer... It's a little better now, so... Yeah, I'm Sorry. just going to turn, 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 turn off gameplay for the remainder because I don't think it's too much, too much longer to go after this. Um, yeah, the... The, the buying habits of younger generations are absolutely something that they have to take into account when looking at growth for the future because ultimately we're not going to be here all the time. We're not going to be here forever. And the, as the generations progress, they do need to, to move on with it. Um, that being said, it is an industry-wide problem and each one of them have to solve this problem in different ways. So Xbox have the issue where they lost, as they've mentioned, as we've mentioned, they lost the biggest generation they could lose, which was the PS4, Xbox One generation. And because of losing that, they lost significant ground over the competitor when it comes to actual in-house um, adoption. Um, now, you went from having, what was it, 80, 90 million consoles with with the, C, the, the 360 to... Um, to, to having 40 million, 50 million consoles with the, the Xbox One. Um, and and the PlayStation severely took off after that and ended up with like 120 million on PS3, or 130 million on PS3 or something ridiculous. Um, and the 125, 130 million on PS4. Um, and now on track so far to kind of match that, if not slightly better at come end of generation, though it could slow down and they have actually reduced their forecast for the coming year. But ultimately, the issues are uh, numerous mitigating factors. PlayStation have also said, like, we've got 120 million plus consoles. We're only doing 20 million, 30 million sales max on first party, if we're lucky. So we have to look at other areas of growth because it's just not enough to spend this much on our big first party titles and only get 10 to 20 million, 30 million at the most sales out of a, out of one when we have 120 plus million customers and we're only doing 20, 30 million sales at the most. 
and in some cases 10 million or less for when they're putting out these big first party titles so they're also looking at other areas of growth and how can we grow how can we tap the market so they've started emphasizing pc much more aggressively now and i think we'll see them grow more there but they ultimately will also be looking at other areas of where can we grow and how can we how can we actually make this a bit more sustainable and ultimately i think it's just the way the wording in which phil spencer has, has said gen z people have just assumed i think that they're just going to target that as their prerogative going forwards of why like gen z's buying habits are severely different to our generation so we're going to kind of focus on that and i don't think that's ultimately what they will do because the biggest spenders will still be our generation the biggest the people that are more likely to buy hardware and games on mass will be our generation because we've got far more expendable income than the younger generation do um of course with the odd um the odd outliers who are younger and have a lot of expendable income um but there are few and far between <laughs> few and far between yeah so ultimately they have to play the balancing game yes they have to think of the future and evolve with the gen and evolve as ages stop playing games and start playing games and so on and so forth. So they start need to start targeting those younger generations more. But they also have to, of course, entice the people who are still probably spending en masse more than the younger generation. So it's a balancing act and but all manufacturers have to apart from Nintendo, all have to <laughs> have to think about the buying habits. Yeah. Um and and how to how to achieve those and as I mentioned, Xbox have got a problem. Their, their problem was they, they lost the biggest generation they could lose. Um, and ultimately, they they understand now that it's going to be sev severely difficult to win over those who are ingrained in the PlayStation ecosystem. Like The likelihood of winning somebody over as a primary console user is very limited you have to now try to fight for them to be a potential secondary and then you've got to justify why somebody would need a secondary platform um i don't think they help themselves in porting their games elsewhere because it then yeah. takes away the justification of why do i then need to invest in this ecosystem um so they they kind of given themselves they're shooting themselves in the foot in certain angles but it's a difficult one, but they have to. It's it's a balancing act going forward. They need the need to uh, to to entice the Gen Zs, but they need to continue to entice our generation in order for us to continue spending like we do now. Yeah, and I, th I think with that, um, the 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 sentiment right now um, for a lot of people are is. They are not sure where Xbox is going and will there still be like the Xbox you you kind of know in a few years. Um, not saying obviously they're going to make a new console. They are already confirmed that it's that that's not what I'm saying. But when you look at the community right now, a lot of people don't really know what is the future of Xbox. What is it? what are they what is their master plan um and yeah this is what what i notice because through all the bad times that xbox had they are now at the at the start of of that place where we wanted xbox to be for many 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 years now yeah yeah Great games are about to release. You get great value for Game Pass, a uh, Game Pass subscription. You have a unified ecosystem across PC and console, uh, at least for the stuff that is in Game Pass. And um, Xbox is actually, if you think about it this way, yeah, in a, in a very good place now. Yeah, lots of great games coming this year, next year, the year after, all good. And still, something weird is happening in the community and um maybe we use that as, as a closing topic for, <laughs> for this whole what's the future of xbox thing um 
Xbox, through all the, the difficult times, what they've always managed is to keep like a great community, a positive community that is excited about the brand, that is uh, willing to trust them that things will get better and and everything. And for some reason, and maybe that's just me, but uh, uh, it, it doesn't feel like that anymore. It feels like, yes, there are the hyperbolts, you know, the complete flip-floppers that went from, oh, I'm a massive Xbox fan to, oh, all doom and gloom. But there's a more nuanced thing going on. Yeah, if you think about it, the potential of us getting an Xbox handheld is exciting. The potential of getting Epic Games or Steam on, on console is actually exciting. It's exciting that we get Hellblade in a couple of weeks and that we play Avout this year and Indiana Jones and Stalker. And this is all exciting. And yet, even though this all this this positive stuff is is out there and and is really like only a few weeks away um somehow i feel it, a weird slightly negative you know um vibe out of the community and that's why is that Ah, uh, I think people, you know what it is, I think at, at times we forget why we love the hobby in the first place and we don't focus on the games that are out there and play the games. Yeah. A lot of us play it, spend a lot of time, and half of it is a lot of time we don't, we don't get enough time to game these days, so when we do it's just, we just see all this negative news and we just, that's all we focus on as opposed to, like, switch off. Twitter, switch off social media, sit down and enjoy playing games. It, it doesn't have to be the newest game. Just get back to enjoying games again, which is part of the issue. Um, it can be. I've I've enjoyed recently diving into some older games just because I've I've been in the mood to play an older game as opposed to a brand new one. Like I haven't really been as much as I haven't. I've been wanting to get onto Rebirth. I haven't really been in the mood to to play Final Fantasy recently. Um when I'm busy and it's one of them games that when I do want to play it, I want to play it for a substantial amount of time in order to get quite a bit done out of it because I don't know when the next time is that I'm going to get to have enough time to play it. Um, so I like to kind of just jump onto things and enjoy it and just... I think just a lot of people like to, to nitpick and kind of get... A bit maybe he's a little overly negative about some of the situations and not look at some of the positive things and the positive steps that are happening in gaming. Um, and the technological advances that allow us to do more going forward that are exciting or the the new hardware that we're potentially going to get that is exciting and the new games we're going to get that's exciting. Like, think of all the good things that are coming out of it. As much as there are negatives, there's a lot of positives as well to come out of it. Um, there's a lot of silly things like this whole um, sweet baby ink thing that people keep moaning about at the moment and... I think people just thrive off negativity at times that really overshadows what this medium's about, which is just enjoying games. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, then again, um, gaming, don't get me wrong, of course we all play or are in gaming because of playing great games, but then gaming is also about community, you know, about discussing what you love, about playing games together with other people. It's about community as well. Um, that's why we do this podcast, because we love our community. We love to engage in the discussion around gaming, love to talk about the hobby and the, the excitement and everything. And um, it, it goes hand in hand. And it is, it is just interesting to see how and I've been doing this for a long time. I've been part of this community for many, many years now. And um, there have always been positive phases and a little bit more negative phases and ups and downs. And I just feel this time it is, it just feels different um, to me because I see a lot of people like really um, not knowing what to make out of all of this. Yeah. I think this is something 
um, this is something where Xbox really should pay attention to because the community aspect has always been like the thing about about the Xbox brand. They have been very community focused. They do a lot of community events. They engage on socials with the community and so on. And if you want to talk about growth, take your community with it. Don't leave it behind. And if this is the, the one thing that I noticed is just it feels different about all this doom and glooming and and we've I think I think what we've seen most recently, now. Boxy. I think what we've seen most recently is because of this whole port game situation, the communities like I think a lot of the Xbox guys have took a, a little bit of a step back. Um especially over recent weeks. They took a little bit of a step back from integrating themselves in the community as yeah. much because of everybody kicking off like little babies about games porting to different platforms and things like that. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're all just getting like, it's, I can understand from their perspective as well. Then, then they start to get like personally attacked and it's games. So they do have a community. They've been very hands-on with the community for years. Um, but they've taken, they've taken a little bit of a step back recently because of a lot of the way that the community's reacted um, to to news based around essentially porting games to other platforms. Yeah, yeah, agree. So let's hope that um, that Xbox can get back that excitement. Um, I mean, June is around the corner. Yeah, new games will be shown. New hardware to some degree, probably not like we talked earlier. Probably not the next gen or a mid gen refresh, but yeah, an Xbox Slim and new controller, stuff like that. And maybe that's what they need now, uh, just to get back into the exciting part. Because again, there is so much to be excited about. Uh, um, they we get great games, get, have s still get great value out of, of the, all the services and so on. So yeah, we shall see how this uh, will continue. But Dutch, we are almost, yeah, we are way more than two hours now into the show. Um, and let's move on from, from Xbox and the Xbox topics. And let's talk about a couple of uh, small things before we go to come to the community questions. Um, I want to talk to you about, um, Borderlands, um, because Take Two is going to acquire Gearbox from Embracer for four hundred and sixty million dollars, um, and they also confirmed Two K has an uh, 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 confirmed that the next Borderlands game is in active development. Um, so, what do you think about Embracer selling off Gearbox and, of course, new Borderlands in the making? Yeah, I mean, I've, you know what it is? I've got Borderlands 3, and I've... I, for some reason, I didn't really get into it. I don't really? know what it was, yeah. I don't know what it was, but I just didn't get into it as much as I did. But I loved Borderlands 2. I played that game to death. But for some reason, and I think it was mainly just down to the co-op factor, I used to play Borderlands 2 co-op all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. But Borderlands 3, no one really picked it up. No one was really playing it. So I ended up just playing it by myself. And it didn't have the same feeling to it. It's a good game. No doubt I would absolutely enjoy it. But it was definitely a game that I more enjoyed playing co-op with my friends than I did playing solo. Um, and I think that was part of the issue. So I would love to see what they can do with a new Borderlands. But ultimately I would have to be... I'm just wary. Okay, so how many people are actually, actually picking this game up? And... Because yeah. if we're getting older and having far less time to game these days, as we'd love to, what's the chances yeah. of us being able to, to, to hook up with friends and, and play these games? So, I, I really enjoyed Borderlands 3. Um, didn't get too much into the end game, but then I, I like to play multiple games, you know, and... Uh, for me, an end game, 
I always say if I get a good campaign out of it and get my money's worth there, I'm fine with it. Yeah. Um, and that, that was the case for Borderlands 3 because it was a great campaign, was fun uh, and so on. The, the good news about this is actually that Gearbox is no longer part of Embracer because Embracer, let's be real here, for a long time, we all thought, oh, they have this great master plan and they want to become like the next EA uh, or something. I think they just um, bit off more than they give you when it comes to development costs. Yeah, absolutely. And um, they, for a long time, they bought a lot of developers, but they were all smaller developers that had smaller projects in that are easier to fund. And all of a sudden, they bought like these big studios with big IPs, yeah, uh, Crystal and and so on, uh, Crystal Dynamics uh, with Tomb Raider and so on. And all of a sudden it all fell apart. They they are not up for like funding these these major games. And so at this point, I'm all, almost just happy that the studio isn't just getting shut down, but finds a new home that yeah. can actually support them and, and help develop a great game because with Embracer, that's just a, just a mess uh, these days. And so I'm glad that Gearbox is now uh, part of Take Two, which already make made sense because of the um, because of the, um, uh, the the already existing relationships. They have published their games. You know, <clears throat> um, it makes sense, and I'm I'm looking forward to to getting a proper new Borderlands. Um, and can't wait. And by the way, Tiny Tina's Wonderland was also a fantastic Borderlands esque game, you know. So, yeah, I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to to see what what the outcome of this will be. Um, what else happened in gaming this week? Uh, we got the well, more or less confirmation that a uh, Toys for Bob, who recently went independent from Microsoft, um now um have agreed to partner with with microsoft and um of course everyone thinks and speculates that it's going to be the next spyro what do you think yeah it'll be the next Where, spyro crash. partnership going yeah next spyro yeah. crash yeah 100 percent. yeah absolutely i've uh, said that they, they, they did an absolutely amazing job on crash trilogy and spyro trilogy yeah. and crash team racing like they were perfect remakes of those games nothing changed it was just revolutionized for modern gaming and they were brilliant they looked great they played great fantastic that's exactly how you meant to do a remake um so to see them working on the new one obviously they had crash 4 which was fantastic and then to see them working on a brand new crash or spyro and i think spyro needs it more than crash because spyro just had its trilogy it didn't have any new games after that, whereas, of course, we've had Crash 4, which was a new Crash Bandicoot. We haven't had a new Spyro in that vein, so I'd love to see Spyro make a return. Um, so fingers yeah. crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, but, yeah, they're a fantastic Absolutely. studio, and I think that's that should be their cadence. You never know. They might partner on a new banjo with them in the future. You just never know. You never know. Indeed. Indeed. All right, Dutch. Let's get to the community questions. Um, we had a couple of uh, community questions uh, this week regarding all the Xbox stuff. What do we think about the handheld? We got that question multiple times. We talked about it. Um, we also uh, got a lot of questions about the Gen Z stuff. We talked already about that. So uh, apologies to those who sent in the questions. Um, we're, we, we've discussed this intensively over the uh, show but we also get uh, a couple of good ones here from sith lord uh, one he writes in um next week i will be starting diablo 4 with a friend any starting tips you can give us oh uh, not really just enjoy the campaign <laughs> yeah See, I would, I can give a couple of uh, beginners tips. I actually posted also a couple on on Twitter, uh, and a lot of people were bookmarking that. Um, so, 
Diablo. Don't worry about you. Don't worry about your armor so much during the campaign. The armor stuff wait yeah. until end game. Just as long as you're frequently yeah. upgrading to higher, power, more powerful gear as you go, because you will need yeah. it. Um, Salvage everything you find and don't need. Don't think about upgrading your stuff during the campaign. Um, not too much. You need it a little bit in order to beat bosses and things. But just get slap uh, on anything. Don't worry about how you look and things. What that that can wait till afterwards. But yeah, primarily just upgrading in order to get to the next person and beat the next big boss and things like that. That's the basics of what you need to worry about. Outside of that, you don't need to worry about the aesthetics during the campaign. No, uh, about aesthetics, definitely not. But if you do so, you can already do that during the campaign with the transmog system, which is yeah. fantastic. But just yeah, wear so... the most powerful gear that you find every time. So if you pick up another exactly. bit of gear that's more powerful, pick it on, put it on. J just put it on and... Uh, if you go to the smith, I still wouldn't recommend to upgrade weapons during the campaign. No, save, no, just... Salvage everything yeah. and save the materials because you're going to do a lot of upgrading um, more towards the end game or higher level yeah. uh, when you reach a higher level. What I also would recommend is try to look for the uh, altars of Lilith. Um, yes. Not only are they giving a great um, um, boost in your stats, but it will carry over to every character you do. So you don't have, with every character, have to look for the altars again. Once you have unlocked the altar, um, the boost you get uh, will automatically be carried over to every other character you might do in a season or uh, in the end game or whatever. So that's definitely, and the same goes for renown. Um, you don't have to do the full renown in every area, but do the first three uh, yeah. tiers because. They, that will give you a skill, additional skill point that will also carry over to every character you do. Yeah. So definitely do that. Um, and then I would also say um, during uh, the campaign, a lot of people. I remember that that uh, for especially for for people that are new to Diablo games. The gems you find they seem pretty useless at the beginning of the game you find a lot yeah. of gems and you don't know what to do with them and even if you put them in your in your loot and uh, in, in 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 your armor or helmet or whatnot it might not sound like it's it's a great boost but they are uh, and you will see that a little later in the game so Get all the gems you need and and think about it. And then also, if you try to figure out, you can always look up builds, but that would rob you of the of what makes actually a big part of of a Diablo game. Trying to figure out the right skill build for you. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter which class you are playing, whether you play as a sorcerer, or necromancer, or whatnot. Um, don't try to, to build a character that is an all round talent yeah um that never uh, helps you the, the best builds are always built in a way that boosts one certain characteristic for instance if you're playing as a sorcerer focus on lighting damage or fire damage or ice damage but not all three yeah um and build your skill set around that boosting everything like do extra damage for lighting and increase chances for critical hit with lighting and then like do that or if you're playing as a barber uh barber, as a barbarian barbar, <laughs> barbarian um yeah in, for instance focus on thorns thorn damage and then put the focus on that and and um and 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 not try to build like an all-round but play around with different skill builds um because that's not only one of the most fun parts of the game but um the game really allows you to reset all your stats yeah you know more or less uh, for free more or less for free uh, all the time especially in the early uh, uh section of the game it'll get a little more costly later on um but they, they definitely try to reset your skill tree try it out different builds see what works for you um yeah um that would be a uh, a tip from my side so what else do we have here 
community questions. There we are. Uh, well, I actually lost my. Um, so we have our friend from Germany. It's actually a German German que quest question. Uh, Gurken fan, uh, which is cucumber fan, uh, <laughs> writes in and asks this. Um, we've heard, I have to translate now uh, into, into English. Uh, we've heard about the new Xbox controller and what it might uh, be able to do. What are you actually hoping for in the next Xbox controller? Um, for me, it's more just quality of life as opposed to anything else. I want them to implement Hall Effect sticks so we no, no longer get stick drift issues. Mm. Um, the bumpers and triggers need fixed. Um, the bumpers have the main issue. Right bumpers are fail on many of the elite controllers um, as well as the regular controllers. And that it fails quite often. Um, so you need to, to fix mainly the bumpers, the Hall Effect sticks. Um, and then look at the last lead, then look at um, haptics. Um, that would be the only real changes. Um, alongside that other quality of life, have the rubber grips as standard. Um, you get them in the um, in some of the special edition controllers, like the uh, Starfield one, for instance, and the Forza one. Um, and you can get them on Design Labs, but just have the, the rubber grips on the back end as standard. I think that would be a good option. Um, and then, like I say, Hall Effect sticks, better bumpers that last much longer or last full stop, um, and haptics. They're, they're the three key things I want to see. Yeah. Um, to me, see, I, I really like my Elite controller, but the Elite still doesn't have um, like the, the layout from the Series X controller with the capture button. On it, so I want a mixture of that, uh, the the elite controller and the capture button thing. Um, and uh, I can fully get behind what you said about the the whole uh, sensor sticks uh, because yeah, stick drifting is just super annoying. But overall, I don't have that many requests about the controller because the controller to me actually is pretty awesome as it is. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. a great controller. I just need some quality of life upgrades. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I mean, there's always the question about the rumble features that, uh, or Haptics. the haptic features yeah. um, uh, from like like the PS5 controller, and I do enjoy those. I think they are great, not for every game, especially when you're playing competitive, but for single player games and so on. That's a really good and cool feature. Of course, if Xbox can implement those uh, in, a, in a controller, I would be up for it. Um, Holm1911 writes in and asks, do you think we will see another um, Xbox developer direct this year? As much as I want to, I'm not sure we will. I mean, the next showcase is obviously the big one in June. Yeah. Um, and then Gamescom, and then Tokyo Game yeah, Show. Yeah, but they usually don't do something uh, like in terms of showcases um, at Gamescom. No, nope. they do um, shows, and they do announce little bits there, but we don't really pay attention because we're actually physically there. But they do yeah. announce little bits, more like indie games and things like that, and they do little things on on that, but it's not big. Um, <laughs> I mean, technically, last year they did another developer direct after the Xbox showcase in June for Starfield. Yeah. Um, so you might see is... one for the likes of Indiana Jones. It's exactly my thought. If I think about their lineup this this fall, with Stalker two in September, Avowed somewhere, and uh, Indiana Jones somewhere, and Towerborn. Also, someone um, it kind of would make sense to do another proper uh, developer direct because I still don't consider the Starfield thing like a 
real develop direct because it was one game um yeah. for 45 minutes i loved it don't get me wrong i i truly did enjoy it but it was like the extended showcase um but yeah i could see them do that uh, uh this fall simply to make sure everyone knows hey we got games now and we got and we have to enough to talk about those games and yeah so i i could see them do one um somewhere in in august or september um would be actually cool to get a proper developer direct from gamescom yeah why not why not do that yeah uh so yeah we shall see we shall see um yeah dutch but that brings us um to the end of this show yes um I want to say a big, big thank you to everyone who joined us here today on on the unusual occasion of a Sunday podcast. Yep. Um, we still got a lot of people here uh, watching and listening to us. So shout out to you guys and thank you for tuning in. Um, and of course, a big thank you to everyone who listens after the fact, either here on YouTube or on Spotify, or on, on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening. Um, we hope you did enjoy the show. Next week, we will be back at the regular Thursday uh, time slot. Yeah. But yeah, Dutch, let everyone know what you've been working on yeah. for a while now. <laughs> yeah, and continue to work on. So uh, yeah, obviously, um, as mentioned at the beginning of the show, for those who are, missed that, um, we've got the Community Indie Showcase, of course, on the 27th of April. Um, so uh, that's 7 p.m. UK, 2 p.m. Eastern um over 60 games um special guests giveaways developer interviews that are shown post show content creators involved again this year as always um and we've got a nice graphical upgrade as well so it'll look even fancier than it has before so um yeah that's what i'm working on this month um game streams have been a little bit limited because i've just been tired with work and, and doing the work on the showcase and things so um, might do the odd gameplay stream every now and again, but ultimately, focus this month is on is on the community indie showcase. So that's that's Sweet. what I'm focusing on. Sweet. All right. Um. So yeah. Again, we will be back next week, next Thursday, with um, a regular World of Gaming uh, podcast. And um, now we all enjoy the long easter weekend or at least most of us do yeah um diehard 79 in the in the chat says hit the like button on the way out yeah we would definitely appreciate that um thank you and again thanks to everyone here uh today in the chat and every listener you guys enjoy your games because that's what matters most with all the controversy right now out there um it's a great time to be a gamer because there are so many great games to play out there. Dragon Dogma is out. Diablo just hit Game Pass. Um, people have been enjoying the Stellar Blade demo. So that's probably also something to look forward to. Rise of Ronin is out. There's just so much to play. Great games everywhere. And you just go out, enjoy that. And we hope to see you back next Thursday. So don't forget to game on. Something's wrong, I feel it circling like vultures around my brain. Couldn't see the danger in your eyes Draw me in, got me spinning now Like water to a drain You were perfect till I realized You hadn't shown your face But you sing a pretty song But you drag my heart along A siren serenade
You lose to love and glory